I was sent to Meadowshare for my second suicide attempt the day after my 20th birthday. It seemed, for all intents and purposes, a good place to be at the time. They offered a huge range of therapeutic activities, from basket weaving to beekeeping to horse riding. Anything to keep us from blowing our brains out, I guess. Let me try that again. I don't use the word suicide. I just say second attempt. I was in Meadowshare after my second attempt. The day after my 20th birthday. It seemed, for all intents and purposes, a good place to be at the time. They offered a huge range of therapeutic activities, from basket weaving to beekeeping to horse riding. Anything to keep us from blowing our brains out, I guess. Sorry, it's a bad joke. But as much as I wanted to hate this hippie, new age bull crap, I found myself enjoying it. So I moved entirely from the environment that had pushed me to the edge twice, and surrounded by similar people who really listened, didn't just nod their heads, wait until they could say their piece. There was an atmosphere at Meadowshare of uh, sort of realistic optimism. Things were shit. Our shit will be shit. But if we tackle them together and take time for ourselves, we can we can work to mitigate it all. And so we did. We worked together, various forms of manual labor occupying our days, interspersed with group therapy, individual therapy sessions, and the nights were for stories. Around a bonfire, movies, or just was reading a book. So close to being idyllic. It really was. There were things that didn't make sense at the time, some that still don't make sense now. Strange traditions that you just grew used to over time. Students were called vessels, which was described to us at the time as being due to the fact that we are all vessels for knowledge and compassion and love. And that is our job to fill ourselves to the brim with all these virtues and more and to shed the toxic and negative things that we'd filled ourselves with previously. For example, a vessel would be chosen on the night where the moon was smallest to stand a watch. This simply meant sitting in a small bell tower by the renovated barn and trying not to fall asleep with the moon a tiny sliver of silver in the sky. We were never told what we were actually watching for, and most students ended up sneaking a torch and a paper bag up and reading pressed against the old wooden boards. We assumed it was some sort of throwback to when the farm was first built, maybe an old Amish or pagan ritual or something that the founder had insisted on and that had been carried on in good faith. I mean, ultimately, isn't that really the story with all rituals? Well, we were not to go to the library in town. If we wanted a book, we were to request it from a member of staff, and they would make sure to get it for us. I remember thinking this was just to do us a favor, to keep the locals from calling us junkies or crazy or insane protect us from the old-fashioned attitudes of the local community. All that and the fact that the turnover was super quick. My place had opened up out of the blue and so many of the friends I had made would disappear suddenly, supposedly having found somewhere else or having made the decision to go home or deciding they, they felt better. This, of course, was said in the letters that we received from them after they left. After one or two, and always one or two, and then nothing but before this all this just seemed like eccentricity to me and i was happy in a life at the meadow share my my favorite activity was beekeeping by far we had 20 hives which is a lot trust me and we we labeled them imaginably one to 20. i'd often walk between them in the days without the beekeeper suit feeling the bees on my skin feeling the soft touch of them land and then fly off the soft buzz Sort of white noise that I could zone out. The bees are friendlier than we give them credit for, and most of the time they'd fly over to investigate you, smell you, perhaps leave a scent on you, and then fly off. So the bees would know that you weren't a threat. Well, the very, very rare occasion that you were stung, it was fine, so long as you didn't panic. Same way that you might get a friend by punching them on the arm, the bees would sting you. It was a sort of test. I don't think it's news to anyone that the bees are disappearing on a global scale. Between 1947 and 2005, the number of bees in the United States declined by over 40%, from 5.9 million to 2.4. And it's shrunk much, much further now. And so every month or so, we shut down a hive. And they'd slowly starve, we assumed, and uh, gradually the population would dwindle until there'd be well, none left. Some confused workers buzzing around, perhaps, and a queen trapped in her honeycomb tomb. It was my fault. In the end, um, 
I was on watch, and the night was black and deep, and stupidly, I forgot to pack more batteries for my torch. So I sat on the bell tower, trying not to let myself get scared, and watching for shapes in the darkness. It was, it was perhaps due to the fact that all my senses were switched off that I first noticed it. A buzz, not unlike that of a nearby hive, but deeper, louder. It sounded as if there were bees crawling up the building around me in the dark. The dark seemed to shake a little, as if the night itself were vibrating. I decided to investigate, creeping down the ladder, opening a back window, so as to make sure that no one heard me, and, and I walked into the field with the hives in. Once I was actually out in the darkness, I began to be able to make out shapes. I could just about make out where to put my feet. I could feel the bees land on me, spraying me with pheromones, investigating with their tiny legs, dancing Morse code on my face and my hands. I let them. I continued to walk towards the source of the noise. The buzzing grew louder, still swelling, and I could make out in the dim light a shape. With the scales of a snake shifting and twisting until I realized it wasn't a snake. And in that fact, the, the faint moonlight was refracting off the abdomens and thoraxes of, of, of thousands of bees who were crawling along the ground, pouring out of the hives I was close to and moving as a unit towards the forest. I know, I know. At that point, I should have, like any rational being, turned around and gone to bed. But I really felt that I, I knew these hives. And I thought perhaps I'd find another hive in the forest or a new queen or, or something that might even explain why some of our hives have started to disappear. And so I, I followed the trail, followed the convulsing, shimmering pipeline of bees from the farm under the fence and through the bushes into the forests. The buzzing grew louder as I got further and further in, and I began to hear strange noises. Noises that were chitinous and organic, scraping and gurgling, but faint, as if happening miles away. I kept following and almost tripped over a root. I stumbled forward and put my hand out to stop myself, catching my balance on a tree, and almost gasped as I saw what was in front of me. A huge hole, blacker than black, in the middle of the forest floor into which streams of bees from all angles, not just from Meadowshare, were crawling into, like, like shimmering veins. Occasionally a bee would crawl up my leg and onto me and wait on my skin, as if listening for something, some, some command, and instead of brushing it off, I'd wait too. Until we both knew I wasn't a threat. Perhaps it was something to do with the pheromones I was covered in. And so I followed them, I followed them into the tunnels. Which is where it all changed. The tunnels were inexplicably warm. They were warm, and when I put my hand on the soil, it was moist. And under the palm of my hand, I could almost... I could almost feel it pulse. Pulse at a regular interval, like a huge... lazy heartbeat. The path ahead was black, but as I blindly stumbled forward, I began to make out a faint light in the distance. It was when I was about halfway that I considered turning back, but when I turned back, I realized I couldn't even see where I'd come in, and all I could hear was the quiet buzzing of bees crawling over my shoes, over my neck, and back in the walls of the tunnel, and it was... It was all I could do to push on. The sounds were still there, something larger, moving, some skittering and creaking noises, and in the dark, I... I pictured mandibles, wings, cases, antennas, rubbing together. The tunnel began to grow lighter, and I realized, looking around, that there were hundreds, if not thousands, of tiny bioluminescent beetles crawling out from holes in the dirt around me, vibrating every now and again. Their shells glowing a dim blue, but together the, the dim blue became a bright light. It was suddenly as if the tunnel was veined, and the beetles and bees moved together in a flowing pattern, forking around rocks or roots only to rejoin each other later. But it was in the chamber, at the end, that everything changed. I had to clamber up a couple of rocks, use roots and handholds, but I finally made it into what seemed like the top of a giant chamber. And for some reason, a reason I still can't entirely place, I stayed cautious, flattening myself against the rock I was on top of and taking care to stay quiet as I navigated myself over it and around the wall. And I peered down, down into the chamber, the room below what I, what, what I saw almost made me gasp. There were 
there were dozens of students. People I recognized in rows and strange pods that seemed to glisten and shine. And they were filled with a clear, bubbling liquid with their heads still exposed. Eyes wide open, staring off into the distance, but somehow I thought still seemingly awake. They were being cared for by those huge, chittering bugs. They didn't look like any bug I'd ever seen, but they were all mandible with huge, hairy thoraxes and several jointed legs that clicked as they walked the walls and ceilings, jaws clacking to each other with the students. I wasn't sure which occasionally crawled up and over a student, letting their antenna brush their faces, their mandibles opening up to reveal one more, making different low screeches and clicks, which seemed to pass for language. And I watched in horror for a while, the students trapped thinner than, than when I'd seen them, paralyzed, but somehow still there mentally, and these huge bugs communicating with, with elaborate machinery that was all organic. The pods, they fed into tubes that ran off into the tunnels and pulsed as if carrying fluid and... And there seemed to be egg sacs placed around the chamber, which bugs would often attend to before returning to the humans. I watched in stunned silence, and finally, without meaning to, I gasped. I'd been holding my breath without realizing, and I suddenly realized I needed air. I noticed. There was a sound like metal on metal, but wet. And the huge bugs looked in my direction, clacking and clicking to each other in a frenzy now, speeding towards me, walking on the ceiling and the floor and the walls, dozens and dozens and dozens of them, about as big as dogs, covered in thick hairs. And I, I, I ran. I ran faster than I thought it was possible. I leapt down the stones, skidding my knees and twisting my ankle, but I kept running. I could barely see the beetles just offering enough light for me to navigate, and I could hear insects behind me still communicating their, their noises echoing off the dirt and down the tunnel as if they were triangulating my position, and I could hear their legs, all of their legs, which must have been hundreds of legs, rattling off stones and the smaller bugs all coming towards me, growing louder and louder, and I was in black now in the dark. The blue beetles were gone, and all, it was all I could do to just keep moving forward. Fighting the feeling of terror in my chest and the taste of, of bile begging for fresh air and I heard something hiss past my ear, but it missed me. I kept running. I was sure now I could hear the beat of wings behind me and every second I expected to feel something hit into me. Hard. And all limbs to, to feel alien mouths clamp down and feel myself, myself paralyzed and dragged back down the tunnel, but... Just as my legs were beginning to scream with pain, I saw light, however dim, and I was out, back into the forest and into the dim light of the moon. They seemed to stop, just before the outside world, and I could hear them hiss and click the entrance of the tunnel. I ran back to Meadowshare, back into my dorm, and I lay in my bed, my heart racing until the, until the sun came up. It was only when I tried to shower the next morning that I realized something was wrong. My neck was sticky. And it stank. It stank like a mixture of paint and, and rotten fruit, and no matter how much I scrubbed, I couldn't get rid of the smell. It was then that I realized that whatever they'd shot at me in the tunnel, it hadn't missed. They'd marked me. And now, now they knew exactly where I was. Hey there kids and happy holidays. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And I just wanted to tell you guys thank you for watching tonight's video. If you enjoy watching videos here on YouTube, then you should check out the Mr. Creepypasta Storytime Podcast, which is available on Spotify and on iTunes and on Google Play and everywhere like that. If you enjoy listening to Mr. Creepypasta Storytime Podcast, you'll enjoy watching it on YouTube because it's the same show. You guys are both hearing the exact same thing at the exact same time. Also, thank you guys for supporting me on Patreon or on Popbase. You guys who are the top supporters on Patreon, especially, thank you so much, like Joey Gilbert, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Chaminsky, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Stephen Van Huss, Tristan Pelton, G Weevil 3, Diana Krause, Asia, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Nico Kyle, Caleb Dougal, 
Daniel Paulson, Dante Rao, Last Blade Song, The Ginger Bros, Don Mühlmeister, Eliminator 86, Nubsky, Finley E. Hopkins, Steampunk Center, Rafael Rodriguez, Optimistic Avocado, and Dr. Strawberry. Everyone there, as well as in the description down below. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to also follow me on Pop Base, where you can get a couple of different updates here and there and play games along with me, then you can do so on your phone. It's on Android and on Apple. And if you guys are looking for something like a hot beverage, such as, say, a tea for the cold winter months, then my wife is still selling teas over at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea, including a Mr. Creepypasta tea that has me on it dabbing. Don't actually, actually, if you do order that tea, request that sticker because we made it, but she didn't want me to put it on the, on the tea because she said it wasn't professional. I think it's the, whatever. Check back throughout the entirety of the holiday season for more horror stories every single day. Forever. Sweet dreams, kids. <laughs>